My dearest June, I met Harold for the first time on a Friday evening in 1951 at a USO dance organized by my big sister Clara. Her husband Edward was a career naval airman and she roped me into hostessing a canteen dance for a group of boys going to Korea. I was only 16 at the time, much more interested in baseball than a bunch of rowdy, desperate teenagers in uniform. But my mother figured it might be a good chance for her peculiar daughter to get out of the house. The dance was nothing special, to say the least, with the schmaltzy music, stars and stripes, crepe paper decorations, and crumbly cookies. It was certainly not something I would have missed my weekly date with my dad and the Dodgers for. Content to ladle punch into cups and stare at the clock, I passed the time wondering if Newcomb was going to pitch a no-hitter that night. He'd had a good year so far, one that wound up being his best ever with 164 strikeouts. I didn't even notice Harold looking at me until he came up to the table. You want to dance, Harriet? he asked, reading my name tag. No, I told him. Come on, sweetheart, I'm going to war. I might die. I stared him down. Fine, I said. But that excuse only works once. He laughed. I'm not kidding you, I said. All right, all right, I'm not that bad a guy. You'll see, he promised. Ah, that's what they all say. <laughs> but the two of us danced under the dim lights of the Knights of Columbus Hall, my hands on his shoulders and his on my hips. He told me all about his family in Brooklyn, his dog Rex and his big brothers who fought in World War II. I probably couldn't have been less interested in anything he had to say until suddenly he goosed me. Just to make sure I was paying attention. I squealed and he grinned at me with his Cheshire cat teeth. You awake there, sweetheart? That was when I slapped him across the mouth and walked out. I was a lady after all. As it turned out, his father worked with mine, much to my embarrassment. And the next time I laid eyes on Harold was two years later on Long Island, where my father's company was hosting a Labor Day picnic for employees and their families. Harold was home from Korea and tagged along with his folks. He didn't recognize me but that big mouth father of his caught me out of the corner of his eye at the goddamn punch bowl. And he said, hey, isn't that Give Him Hell Harriet? Give Him Hell Harriet was my nickname after the dance. It was the height of the Truman administration and everyone thought that it was very clever. Yeah, that's her, he said. He was dressed in his uniform. With an arm like yours, he said, you should play in the softball game this afternoon. As a matter of fact, smart ass, I'm pitching. And I did. I knocked his smart ass to the ground with the ball, but immediately after I whacked him, I was so overcome with guilt, I rushed to his side and I yelled at him, God damn it, Harold, you had to crowd the plate. He fell in love with me right then, June. And although I'm sure it was because of my nerve or my temper or maybe my sense of humor, I bet it didn't hurt that my measurements were 37, 23, and 36, just like Marilyn Monroe. We saw each other every day after that. And eventually he asked, give him hell, Harriet, to be his girl. He had to ask four times before I finally accepted. And when I did, I realized I loved him. I loved him with everything I had. Naturally, uh, this isn't easy for me. to leave him here alone.
I just didn't have much choice of matter. When it all started a few years ago, I thought I could take care of them. It was, it was only occasional issues, nothing that couldn't be fixed with gentle reminders. I would leave sticky notes on the stove. Don't forget to turn off the stove. And on the door, please shut door. In the bathroom, please turn off faucet. But soon the words stopped making sense to him. And then eventually the world stopped making sense to him. He began to lose the world. And when he lost his world, I lost him. That was when I found this place. I've been able to join him every day for as long as we wanted to. We would sit hold hands in the sunroom and talk about our day. His eyes would light up when I would visit and I'd kiss him, like I still do. I kiss him on the forehead. Harold Angel, that's what I call him. It's corny, I know, so shoot me. <laughs> but lately he's uh, been forgetting me. My kisses, though welcomed, have become foreign. My visits, though frequent, are now punctuated with the pain of loss and confusion. And I admit, it's harder now that I've been noticing that he's become rather fond of you. I'll come in sometimes when you don't know I'm there. And I'll watch you from another room. I notice that occasionally you'll fondly hold his hand or exchange fond and loving glances. The uh, orderlies say that that's normal. That he doesn't remember that he has a wife and that he's seeking companionship. The last time I was there, I couldn't help myself. I had to talk to you. I had to tell you that this was my husband and that you can't have him, June, you can't. I loved this man for 57 years. 58 in August. And I've cared for this man every day of my life, and I don't know how not to care for him. I went over to you both, and Harold smiled his familiar smile and said, Oh, June, this is, this is. And he looked up at me, and he said, this is my friend. Reluctantly, I extended my hand to you. You shook it demurely. As I told you, my name was Harriet. And in a moment of recognition that was all too brief, Harold looked at me and said, give him hell, Harriet. The two of you went right back to talking as I sat in the recliner adjacent to your love seat. You told him about your children, and he told you about his big brother got the Purple Heart at Normandy, about how brave he was. Your eyes glistened. He was so pleased at how interested you were. And through the fog of his disease, I saw a flicker of light that was the man I married, the young man handsome in his uniform, so proud, so damn cheeky, and so eager to impress a pretty girl. That was when I realized he loved you. Oh, and, and not the same way he loved me, and not better than he loved me. 
but he did love you. He loved you, and he wanted you to be his companion. I resigned myself to this that day. And in my resignation, I went home and wrote a brief but comprehensive list that I have included for you here. It, it has a few things on it that you should know about Harold, my husband of 57 years, 58 in August. One, Harold never liked to talk about his war. He lost friends and unit members, and I think he always secretly felt like no matter what he did there, it never would have been as good or as brave or as heroic as what his brothers did in World War II. So do him a favor, June. Listen to the war stories about his brothers, but never make him tell you his. Two, Harold lately seems to like his meals in the afternoon. Waffles are a new favorite. He likes them with syrup and whipped cream, if you can manage it. Three, Harold wakes up at night. He feels lost most of the time and he wants to walk until he finds where he's supposed to go. The doctors call it sundowning. I call it itchy foot. The nurses will probably have to handle this, but if you do stay in the same room in one night, you wake up alone. I don't want you to be afraid like I was. And I'm sure he's safe here. With you. Four, uh, he's terribly afraid of bugs, palmettos especially, but he'll never tell you. He's too proud. Everything else, June, you just find out on your own. You'll find out in the times you spend talking, whispering love through hearing aids, gazing at each other through thick prescription lenses, all while I look on like I do every day in another room. Occasionally interrupting to kiss my Harold on the forehead just to let him know I was there. Because I was there. Sincerely, give him hell, Harriet. <laughs>